Hey, welcome back. In this video, we're going to continue our discussion of TradingView strategy alerts. Specifically, we're going to focus on the webhook alert functionality. So what we're gonna do is take an example PineScript tutorial. We're going to walk through that PineScript tutorial and talk about when it would enter and exit a position. And we're going to create an alert for that PineScript strategy. And I'm gonna show you what the message looks like when an alert is triggered. We're going to take that message and convert it to a JSON format that can be processed by a Python program. So then once we have this message in a nice structured format, we're going to create a Python Flask web application that receives this message and can do whatever we want. In this case, we're going to place buy and sell orders using the Alpaca API. And I'm also gonna show you how to uh, add some additional functionality. So we're going to uh, post a, a message to a Discord chatbot whenever uh, this TradingView strategy alert gets fired. In addition to developing this Flask application locally, I want to also show you how to deploy this application to the cloud. So when I previously discussed webhooks in some of my other videos, I used AWS Lambda functions. Specifically, I used a framework called AWS Chalice. And what I found is that some people had trouble with that or just didn't want to configure AWS. So I thought I'd provide a couple of alternatives for people that don't want to use AWS Lambda. So the first alternative that I'll demonstrate is how to build a webhook using the Flask framework, which is just a simple micro framework for Python. And I'm gonna show you how to develop, develop that application locally. And then I'm gonna show you how to deploy it to the cloud using Heroku, which is a platform as a service that is owned by Salesforce. This is gonna be free and it just makes it really easy to take whatever web application you have. It has a variety of supported frameworks and you can just deploy it to the cloud by just pushing a git commit and then it'll deploy it. It'll give you a URL that's generated and we're just gonna plug that URL into a trading view and it'll start executing our trades. The second alternative I want to demonstrate is how you can just host your Flask application on your local machine, so on your laptop, and then generate a URL that can be accessed from the outside world. And so we're gonna use a utility some people mentioned in the comments called ngrok, and what that'll do is generate a little host name URL for our webhook that can be publicly accessed and we're going to have TradingView post to that URL and authenticate it with a passphrase and then have our local machine execute those orders for us. So that's enough talking for now. Let's go ahead and start building this out. If you like the content I create on this channel, please like and subscribe, follow me on Twitter and check out the links below. There's a variety of ways to support the channel. So let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing you'll need since this is a TradingView tutorial is you'll need a TradingView account. So if you don't have one already, if you go to any video on my channel and scroll down, this is a video where I talked about how to integrate TradingView strategy alerts with the Binance API. So this is the stock version of that. And so I'm gonna scroll down, it says sign up, for, sign up for TradingView. So if you click that, you'll get this chart and you can just say uh, sign up for a free trial. And since webhooks are a pro account feature, you need a pro account. And so you can try that free for 30 days. So I'm logged into my TradingView account now, and the first thing I'll do is just pull up a ticker of interest. Let's do Apple, since it's a popular example, and then I'm gonna click full featured chart. That's gonna bring up a full window with a candlestick chart for Apple, and I'm gonna go to the daily time frame. So at the bottom of the screen here, you have this Pine editor. You can click that, bring up this editor, and you can start entering in PineScript code. And so we're, gonna, we're going to use a pre-written example. So I'm gonna go to codify.net, and there's some strategies. Uh, this person has written out detailed tutorials on how to use PineScript, and so we're just gonna use this as an example and then have it trigger some alerts and talk about what it looks like. And so this article is called Programming the Bollinger Band Breakout Strategy. And so you can scroll through this. If you wanna read through this, you can. I'm gonna talk about real quick the basics of what it's doing. And so at the bottom of this article, he actually has the final code here. And I made some slight tweaks because it looks like this is for uh, PineScript 3. So this actually throws some errors. So I modified this slightly just to simplify it a little bit and also to put PineScript version 4. Okay, so I have this saved out already where I've copied this down and I will load it into my chart. So I'm gonna click open and I have this script and I'll post the source code to this if you want to uh, copy it down and use this one or you can just load any other of the scripts here. If you go to uh, indicators, 
Um, you know, there's some favorites like the squeeze momentum indicator that I talked about in a previous video by Lazy Bear, but you can browse the public library and use whatever script you want. I'm just gonna load this one as an example. So I have this one already saved and I'm gonna say open script. I'm gonna open my Bollinger Band breakout script, okay? And so when I do that, you'll see it starts with version four. So this is version four of PineScript. And then each PineScript strategy has to start with its a strategy word here and you give it a few parameters. And so for simplicity, I've made this just a simple uh, initial capital. I set it to $1,000. You could bump this to $10,000 or however much money uh, you want to trade for your overall account. We're saying we want to overlay the Bollinger Bands on top of the chart rather than being an indicator that's graphed on a separate chart below. And we give it a title of Bollinger Breakout. And so you see in the top left here, it says Bollinger Breakout, right? And then we also give it some settings. And so the Bollinger Band Breakout strategy has a few settings. So let's talk about what the chart looks like first of all. Uh, so you'll see this red and green line around the chart. So those are the upper and lower Bollinger Bands. So the way the Bollinger Band breakout strategy works here is you'll see this middle line here, which is like a light blue color it looks like, is a moving average. In this case, the default here is the 350 day a simple moving average. And so this is kind of tracking the moving average of Apple stock over time. And this Bollinger Band breakout strategy, uh, the way it works, it's not like a revert to the mean strategy. It's saying when this pegs the upper Bollinger Band, then we're saying there's strong momentum and we're going to ride that trend until it falls back to the moving average. So let's look at this real quick. So the simple moving average length here, we're saying is an input. We're giving the simple moving average a default length of 350 using this default value here. And, but we're also providing an input, that way the user can tweak these settings. So these inputs, if you hover over here, there's this little settings. If I do that and click that, you see this SMA length? This is an input generated by this input function. So if I don't wanna use the 350 day simple moving average, I can change it to 200 or 250 or whatever. I can also control the upper and lower settings of the Bollinger Bands, right? And so you'll see he's also made these upper and lower Bollinger Band offsets here and give them a title, right? And those titles go onto this form, generates an input, and we're using 2.5. And so these offsets are actually standard deviations. So the upper and lower Bollinger Bands are just the moving average plus 2.5 standard deviations above and minus 2.5 standard deviations below. And then you can modify that depending on how, some people use two standard deviations and so the Bollinger Bands will be a little bit closer in then, right? So uh, that's how you define the Bollinger Band offset. And you can see our SMA value is the SMA length. So it's 350, it's taking the SMA of the close. So we're having this, we're plotting this uh, SMA here. So we're doing a plot of this SMA value that we calculate. And so we're adding that plot and we're saying it's color teal. So that's why it plots the 350 day moving average in teal. And then we're also calculating the upper and lower Bollinger Bands. So that's just the SMA value plus 2.5 standard deviations times the, or times the standard deviation, which we calculate the standard deviation of the close times the offset. So since we, our offset is 2.5, we're saying 2.5 times the standard deviation that was calculated and then we're adding it to the SMA value and then plotting in green and then we're subtracting from the uh, simple moving average and plotting it in red and that gives us our Bollinger Bands, right? And then once we have this plotted, our strategy, we need to define when we enter and exit the trade. And so we're setting some Boolean values here saying enter long when uh, the close crosses over the upper Bollinger Band. And so you see this is graphically indicated on the chart automatically. And so you'll see um, in, let's look at a good example more recently, you can see uh, when would this have entered. So in October of 2019 here, you can see that Apple hit this upper Bollinger Band and that's when we wanted to enter. We're saying it had strong upward momentum, like a, a high standard, it went way above the simple moving average, right? According to our standard deviation settings, we hit the upper Bollinger Band and we're saying that trend is gonna continue and we're going to ride that trend until we close below the simple moving average. So if I scroll back here, you can see an example of when this triggered. So this will be early 2017, right? We hit the upper Bollinger Band 
and then our exit, we're saying that we want to exit the trade when the close goes below the simple moving average we define. So we enter here, uh, the trend is up for a long time, right? And then, but we don't actually exit with the strategy until the price closes below the simple moving average here. So you see our exit right here when it closes below this teal line. So this is a nice profitable trade. Did it capture 100% of this move? No, but we did ride this trend for a good amount of time. Okay, so we enter the trade when we cross over the upper Bollinger Band and we exit the long when we close below this teal line, the simple moving average, right? And then we also can short using this strategy. So we use the upper Bollinger Band to determine when we're going to enter a long, but we can use the lower Bollinger Band to enter a short. And let's see if there was a good time on here to uh, short Apple stock. Usually not a good idea to short Apple stock is what I've learned. So uh, let's scroll back here and see. Okay, so let, let, let's look at, let's use another feature to find this. So on a strategy tester here, what this actually does is backtest this strategy. So if you, if you create a PineScript strategy, there's a strategy tester tab, and I'll show you the profit and loss from the strategy. So you look like, it looks like this was very profitable. So we got a 78% return from Apple stock. And then if you click this other tab, performance summary, shows a lot more information about around uh, commissions. If you enter commissions, percent profitable, average win trade, so if you click on list of trades, you can see a list of trades that you would have entered and exited and what the outcome would have been. And so let's see if we can find a time when it said to short Apple stock. So if I scroll down here, you can see uh, most of these are longs, but there's a short here, 2008, right? Makes sense. Some people entered short and this was a bad trade. So uh, if I look in October of 2008, see the red line, it looks like it uh, hit this lower Bollinger Band here. So it said short Apple here. Uh, right there and then it didn't really drift down and then boom the recovery happened in March went back above the simple moving average right here and you would close your short and so that was a big loser right there so um, lots of winning trades here lots of big trades where you rode the trend a long time but definitely some big losing trades as well so you can experiment with this pine script and change the parameters. Maybe you want to work on a shorter time frame. This is on the daily time frame, but if you tweak these numbers and maybe you're a day trader, you want to operate on the 15 minute or hourly time frame or whatever time frame you want, you can experiment with this. Um, but the point of this was just to walk you through a quick trading view strategy that uses Bollinger Bands. And then now we're going to take this strategy and I'm going to create an alert. So to create an alert based on this Pine Script strategy, I will go down here in my Pine Editor and then I click Strategy Tester here. There's a couple of ways to do it. There's, there's these alarm clock symbols. There's one on the right side of the screen and there's one on the left side over here. And so above my strategy, I can click uh, that alarm clock and it'll create an alert based on that strategy. And since I'm on the daily time frame for Apple right now, it'll create the alert on the daily time frame. But if I were to change this to like the five minute time frame, um, it would rerun the strategy, back test it differently, and I could create the alert and it says create alert on Apple on the five minute time frame. And the drop down by default will just say the ticker symbol Apple, which uh, it has some built in conditions that you can use. So you can say, you know, crossing up over the price of 135 or whatever price you choose. And I in, in the first video I did on TradingView alerts, I actually just used crossing above on S&P 500. So I said when the S&P 500 crossed above 2800 or 285 earlier this year, then we were going to enter the position because we'd say, we said, oh, we're past resistance, right? So in this case, we're going to click the drop down and we want to use our Bollinger Band breakout strategy. So I'm gonna select that as the condition. And this is gonna let me set an alert on my strategy ent entries and exits, and I'll get a notification when those entries and exits occur. So if you look, there's a variety of ways that you can configure this alert. So I can give it an expiration time if I want, or I can let it uh, run forever. Uh, there's some alert actions here, so you need to choose how you want to be alerted. So the way most people actually use these alerts is they just wanna get an email or a text message. So they don't wanna watch the charts all the time, but when something significant happens, uh, they want to be alerted by email or SMS text message, and then they look at it and go, oh, should I place this trade? And then you know they'll go manually enter that trade. But in our case, we want this to be running in the cloud 
and be able to place these trades without any human intervention. Once we have the strategy set up and it's tuned in, you know, we're, we're dialed into our settings we like and we trust it enough and we've added our back testing, error handling, all that, we feel it's very reliable, then we can say, oh, let's, let's let this webhook trade it for us. And so uh, on a text message alert, if you clicked uh, more actions, you could say send email to SMS. So you could add text message alerts or emails. The message you receive looks like this. It says Bollinger Band Breakout. So it'll show the name of your script and your settings, and then it'll insert these placeholders. So it'll say strategy.order.action, right? And these little curly, these uh, placeholders with the curly braces around them, these will get substituted with some metadata about what actually happened, uh, some information about the chart and the setup. So since our strategy here is entering and calculating a number of contracts to buy, then this little placeholder here will get substituted in, substituted with an, an actual number. And then same thing, the ticker here, it has a placeholder for ticker, ticker, that would be replaced with the ticker AAPL, right? They're just variables. And then position size and so forth. And so if you click on this question mark here, it'll show you there's tons of these placeholders available. So we can get uh, access to the closing price of the previous bar when this uh, uh, alert fired. And we could also get the volume and a variety of things. So there's tons of these and they're all documented. And with the addition of strategy alerts, you'll notice there are some additional placeholders, strategy position size, order action, order contracts, and so forth. And so if you look at the full code of this Bollinger breakout strategy, um, he actually he does more calculations than what I just showed. Uh, he actually does some uh, risk calculations. And so he, he updates the position sizing. So if you were to order Apple a long time ago and you were to make a profit, you could reinvest that profit. You could risk only a certain amount of capital and so forth. So he does more calculations to calculate calculate the position size. What I just showed was just buying and selling 10 shares. So be sure to study this because you'll want to change your position size over time, most likely. Um, so for simplicity, we just did uh, 10 shares of Apple. So the number 10 would appear here when this alert triggered, right? So that's all good. So this looks like a text message or an email. I'd read this as a human. But as we discussed, a computer program doesn't know how to parse it. Like when it says the number 10, right? It's going to be like 10 of what? So what we want to do is send this in a structured format to our computer program. So what I've done is taken all these placeholders and formatted a JSON payload. That way, uh, it's uh, the message is sent in such a way that our Python program can understand. And I've done this in advance. And so I put this on the GitHub repository, and I did this for the last video. So I just completed a video on strategy alerts for the Binance API. And I put it here in case you want to use this for crypto and Binance. And so in this payloads example, um, I showed the format of the payload, right? And so if you take this format, uh, you can put this inside of the message and it'll use all the placeholders and it'll send your alert in the form of a JSON message, right? So it would substitute a passphrase. So we're going to have it send us a passphrase. That way we can verify that this webhook request is coming from TradingView. So you can make up your own little password. And then our web app is going to see that and say, is that ABCDFG or whatever long password you choose, right? And it'll say, is this a valid passphrase? If it is, then it can execute the trade. But if not, we're going to reject that message. Okay, we'll get a timestamp, an exchange, a ticker. We'll get some bar information. So I grouped all the placeholders for the previous bar. So when this alert fires, we'll know what the previous bar was that closed for Apple for whatever time frame we're on. And maybe you want to use the previous bar to determine the limit price for your order, or you want to calculate a stop loss based on this and so forth. And then you also, I have grouped all of the strategy placeholders together, together under this strategy key. And so we'll have position size, order action, whether it's a buy or sell, contracts, 10 shares of Apple or 100 shares, whatever. Uh, an order price. So this order price is calculated by TradingView. I believe they use a broker emulator to determine a rough price that you should be able to get uh, in the back test. Uh, but you can calculate the price however you want yourself. Um, there'll be an order ID um, and it'll show whatever your current market position size is and your previous market position size. And note, this is kind of based on what TradingView thinks you have. So this is kind of detached from your actual brokerage. So uh, what will happen is your market after you enter a buy so this will fire first and the order action will be buy and you'll buy 10 shares of apple stock and it's going to assume that you know you made that buy and then it'll say your market position is 10 
So your previous market position might have been you had zero shares of Apple and you were flat. You, had, you were not long or short. And then your current market position gets updated to say, oh, I'm long 10 shares of Apple now. Okay. So that's what the format looks like. And when I put this in my webhook, it's going to fire and fill in those numbers. And so the filled in format, I also posted in the payload. And we can use this to test our webhook. So what I can do is post this payload with some values filled in for Apple and make sure it can execute a, a trade against Alpaca. And we can test our webhook locally and then we can deploy it. And we know that same payload will be sent to our webhook in the cloud. And that's how we test that it works. So I'm going to click create here. So after I click create and then look on the side where this alarm clock is, you'll see my list of alerts. And if I click on that, you can see the message that's going to be sent. And those placeholders are going to be replaced with real values. And then, you know, I can delete my alerts and so forth. So to show you what I would ideally like to do is show you uh, these values filled in and have this alert trigger in real time while this video is going on. But this is the weekend right now and the market is not open, so I can't show you that. So the way I've shown this in previous videos is by using the crypto market since it's always open and I can show that happening. And I'm going to demonstrate that real quick before we jump back to stocks just so you can see what this looks like when it pops up. So to show you what one of these webhooks looks like filled in in real time, I went ahead and pulled up the Ethereum chart just so I can show you some price action in motion since the crypto market is always open and I'm recording this on the weekend. I pulled up this and I called this the, the Doji SMA strategy and this is a money losing strategy that just watches the minute, uh, the of the five minute or the two minute crossover, the five minute. So some arbitrary strategy to uh, force some web hooks to fire so that we can see them in real time. So uh, don't, don't use this strategy at all. Uh, and so you'll see this is firing um, alerts whenever um, the doggy door, I call it the doggy door. So I, I identified it, the entry, I gave an ID of doggy door and the close, I close the doggy door. And so it's, it's writing open doggy door whenever uh, I open the strategy or enter the strategy and it's saying close doggy door after it closes. And so I enabled the alert here for Ethereum and let's see if a new long will get fired here. Uh, so that green line is gonna cross above the yellow line and we're gonna say go long and we should get an alert triggered here in a moment because it looks like a big uh, green candle is about to get printed. All right, so this big green candle printed here and looks like my alert popped up and you'll see that the JSON message that we have has been filled with actual values. And since it's the Ethereum chart, right, um, it filled it with Ethereum related data uh, that's related to this chart that we have open. So I pulled this up and so this was just triggered and I can get this payload here and we can copy it to our Visual Studio code and we can start testing this payload against a Python web app that we write. And so just to show you, um, I'm going to paste that here. I'm going to prettify it with my plugin and we got a passphrase. We have a timestamp. So it's 31 minutes past the hour. We just, we just received it. Uh, this was from the Binance exchange, Ethereum USDT. We have the open high, low close of the previous bar. So if you go back to Ethereum, uh, to the chart here, uh, you should see this bar here. Uh, it looks like it had a close of 353.18. Oh, actually, it's probably the bar before. So that would probably be 352.78. And if I look here, the close with 352.78. So this long bar uh, triggered the alert. So after it closed, we have the information about the bar in this uh, part of the payload. And then our strategy here calculated um, a buy and sell. So the position size, it looks like uh, the way I had it, the contract size was just 0 0.07, right? And so we could use we can have this payload get posted to our Flask web application, process it and place an order and send it to another API and send it to our Discord chat room. You know, say Ethereum traded, post it to our chat room and post the quantity, how much money we made, that sort of thing. So that's how our alerts look and that's how it looks in an email and a pop-up. So all we have to do now is enable it as a webhook and then we're gonna give it a URL like this after we deploy our, our app and it's gonna be like, uh, alpaca webhook.herokuapp.com slash webhook and then it's going to post this payload uh, to our app in the in the cloud and then we're also going to make a local version where we have this ngrok url and have it posted to our local server as well so that's enough of trading view right now so let's go ahead and jump to the python side and create an app to process this message so as usual we're going to start from scratch so i have an empty visual studio code editor that's open right here 
I'm going to create a new folder. So I'm going to open the folder. I'm going to do a new folder. I'm calling it Trading View Alpaca uh, Webhook. Okay. And I'm going to click Open. And we have a new folder with nothing in it. I'm going to create a requirements.txt file that's going to list out the requirements we need for this application. And there's not very many of them. We're just going to need Flask, which is the web application framework that we're using. We're going to need Unicorn because we're going to deploy this application to Heroku and it's going to get served up by Unicorn. And then we're going to use, instead of HTTP requests, regular HTTP requests this time, we're going to use Alpaca Trade API, and we're just going to use the official uh, Python library that Alpaca's made. I've been issuing a lot of raw requests in this video, but I figure I should use their official client for once. Okay, and I'm also going to use the request library. Uh, that way I can send an, HT, an HTTP request to Discord. So I'm going to send a message to uh, Discord to post a chat message in this alert as well. Okay, so that's my requirements.txt. And I have a virtual environment that I set up, so I'm going to enable it. So I'm going to do activate like that. And I've done this in many videos. Learn how to create a virtual environment because I install all my packages inside of a virtual environment. So that's activated now. And if I go to my uh, trading view alpaca webhook directory and I type pip install requirements text like that with a dash r parameter, it'll install all of the packages that I have defined in my requirements.txt file. Okay, the next thing I'm going to do is create a file called app.py and we're going to have our entire Flask application live in this application app.py. And I'm also going to create a config.py and as usual we store some config settings like our API keys, passphrases and things like that in there and you'll enter your own there. Okay, so in app.py we need a new Flask application and we usually just copy the quick start guide from Flask. So if you search for Flask and Python you'll get this flask.palettes project, and there's this quick start guide right here. This is the documentation for Flask, and we're going to create a new application. We're going to paste that into app.py, and we're going to, so all this does is it imports Flask, creates a new Flask object, which is a new application, and it defines a simple hello world example. And all this does is map a route that's, this is a decorator for this function. And so this route, just slash, returns, uh, calls this function hello world, and returns the string hello world to the browser. So to spin up the Flask development server, you just need to type a couple of commands. So if we go back to our quick start guide, this is our minimal application code, and then it gives us a couple of commands here. So we want this export Flask app equals, and so we're creating an environment variable, and we're going to say app.py, since ours is called app.py, and this will let it know when we type Flask run, it'll know where the application is. So if I type Flask run, It'll load up an environment and it'll say running on 127. So it's running on local host here on port 5000. And if I paste that into my browser, you'll see since the route is slash, we get hello world there. Okay. The next thing I want to do is enable debug mode. That way when I add new routes or new code, it'll automatically reload the web server. So we don't want this development mode production yet. So what I'll do is enable the debugger and reloading. And so to do that, there should be another command on here called debug mode. And you just do this export flask and equals development. So we're going to run it in development mode first. Okay, so I'm going to stop that. Control C, export flask and equals development. If I run it again, you see the environment is development and debug mode is on. So if I add a new route now, let's call it def webhook, it'll reload and have this uh, route available to us. So I'm going to do return, this is the webhook route. And then to map, to decorate this function, I'm going to do app.route, and I want this accessible at slash webhook. And so when I hit slash webhook in the browser, it'll call this webhook function and return this response. So that reloads automatically. And now if I go to slash webhook, that's the webhook route. If I go back here, it's a hello world. So that's how you create routes in Flask. And so now I'm going to replace this hello world. I'm going to call it dashboard. And let's just create a quick template real quick. So you don't have to do this part. I'm just going to do this just to make it more of an app. So we're going to do uh, a render template. So I'm going to import render template and create a quick HTML template just to make this look a little prettier. Really, we, we only really need a webhook. We don't really need a dashboard. But I'm going to do this just to add some, some extra features to this. So I'm going to return render template. 
and I'm going to call the template dashboard.html, and then I'm going to create a new folder called templates. And FlaskRD by default looks in an, a directory called templates. And if I create a dashboard.html in here and create some HTML tags, uh, and I'm going to create some styles real quick as well. And let's create a body. And I'm going to say, I'll pack a dashboard. Okay, do that. And then let's get a little uh, alpaca logo just to make it look cooler. So alpaca markets logo. And let's just take this logo here and include it on our page. So I'm going to copy the image address and let's say uh, image source equals that. And we'll give a style. We'll do body background black. Okay. And let's see what happens there. So uh, my app is rendering a template. Instead of returning a string, we're saying render this HTML template. So we don't want to like write all of our HTML in one big, str big string. We want an HTML file. That way it's a little easier just to control the presentation part in this HTML file. So if I go back to my dashboard now and reload it, you see we have a web page with our little alpaca guy here and then what i'm going to do here is just show a list of trades we made so we're going to use the alpaca api get our list our order history and and place it on here and show it in a table and so uh, let's do that so let's go ahead and set up the flat the uh, alpaca api and so to do that we need to since we already installed the package for alpaca we just need to import alpaca trade api like that as trade api and at the top here, let's go ahead and create an, an instance of this. So let's initialize our API and tell it our API key. That way this is linked to our Alpaca account. So I'm gonna do trade API.rest. I'm gonna do config dot, I'm gonna put my API key and secret key inside of here. So API key equals, and you can put your API key and API secret equals your API secret. So you'll have one on your account. And actually, I can go ahead and do this because I just create a new one and throw it away. So Alpaca makes it very easy to create and throw away uh, API keys. So I'm going to log in as myself. And so, and so I'll go into my paper account here and log into Alpaca Markets. And you see, I have some old Apple trades in here that way I was demonstrating. And it says your API keys. I can regenerate a key, delete the old one, create a new one. Uh, so I'll copy this API key ID and change it later. So I'll do API key equals that, secret key equals that. Okay, and I'm also gonna set that passphrase we talked about here, webhook passphrase. And let's set this to uh, some long string, some long string, one, two, three, choose something more random than that. And so we're gonna authenticate our webhook request by just checking a passphrase. So just simple, simple method there. Okay, so now that we import it, we have our config file. Uh, let's go ahead and import config. That way it's accessible in here. And then now my uh, REST API, if I hover over, uh, I believe it'll show me the parameters. There you go, key. So you need the key, then the secret key, and then the base URL. So I'm gonna do config dot API key, config dot secret key, or API secret, and my base URL is, uh, and this is the paper API, so I'm gonna copy this, I have this written down. Uh, so you can do API for the real account or paper API if you wanna do a paper trade. So we'll do a paper trade for now. So uh, API equals trade API rest, we've initialized it, and now let's just see if we can get our account and orders real quick. So I'm going, now that I have API initialized in our dashboard, I'm gonna say order equals API and you see how my auto completion detects this in Visual Studio Code, because I have the Python extension installed. Uh, it can look at this and this is all the functions I have available. And so I'm gonna use one called list orders to get all my orders. And in Flask, I can pass this variable here, orders, to my template by saying orders equals orders. And that makes a, uh, let's call it alpaca orders just to make it unique. So in our template, this will now give me a, a named placeholder or a, a variable called alpaca orders, and it's gonna be set equal to what was returned in orders. So if I go to my dashboard here and just create a quick table, I can loop through, so I can do for order in alpaca orders. Um, we can just display our orders, okay? 
And so our order has a number of attributes. Let's, let's look at what those attributes are. So I'm going to print these orders on my console real quick and hit this route just so we see what we can display in our template. So we hit our endpoint again, and we look on our console, and you see we have a list of orders. There's a bunch of uh, dictionary data here, and we can access those keys. So you see we have like a quantity, order type, and so forth. And so what I can do in my template here is write out these keys and display them in a table. And so I'm gonna loop through and create new table rows and just display these as I go. So let's, let's create a few cells here. And I know this is deviating from our goal of just doing the webhook, but I just wanted to make a simple dashboard. All right, so let's create a few things. I'm gonna do uh, an order dot created at, and these are in, in curly braces. And then we're gonna do, uh, let's show the symbol we ordered, and we're gonna show the uh, type of order. So it has a type, a side, so whether we bought or sold, so order.side, and I'll also do a quantity, limit priced, and filled average price. So order.quantity, uh, order, order.limit price, and then the order it got filled at, order.filled uh, average price. Okay, and let's just see if we can print all our orders on the screen. Uh, so you don't see anything because the background is black, so I'm gonna do a font, family, Arial, and then let's do text align center, and let's do uh, color white. Okay, if I do it like that, you'll start to see some information here. So that was uh, very easy. And so let's do some stuff to our table. So let's do table background white, and then have the color black be in there. Do that. Background black, color white. Do that background white, color black, there you go. Uh, okay, cool, we have that. And you know, we can add a little more style here. Let's do like a padding uh, 15 pixels and just display that out. I'll add a margin and I'm just adding some CSS since, since I know this stuff all right. You don't have to do any of this if you don't want to. And I'll put some headings on here so we can do like uh, some headings So we'll do Add a bunch of headings, right? So, so add a bunch of those, and then uh, I will do created symbol. Uh, what do we have? Type and side quantity, and then limit price, and then filled price, right? Okay, so we have some some headings here, and then so we can style our headings. We'll give those a background of light yellow and then we can also set uh, let's do like a border radius to make this round so border radius on the table and let's say that's 15 pixels right okay 10 pixels and then let's give it a little more padding cool right so that looks pretty decent we got our alpaca dashboard we got a logo and then we have our list of trades. You see some market orders, some quantities and some buys and sells and so forth. So you, it looks like I did some in April previous video and then I did a few to test this video out already. So we have our list of trades and now we can build our webhook URL, our webhook URL and you should see it append to this list of trades. So we could like create our own dashboard for like monitoring our trades. I know you can just log into your Alpaca account, but if you wanted to build your own like trading platform on top of Alpaca, then you could create your own custom dashboard. So I just wanted to show that's another possibility we could explore in the future. So that is a Flask template. This is a get request. So I'm retrieving information and rendering a template in response. I'm accessing the Alpaca uh, API here and using their official library. So now what we'll do, I'll delete this orders thing. And then now let's build out our webhook. So our webhook from TradingView is actually a post request. So by default, these routes are get request. So if I, uh, if I want this to be a post request, I need to add methods equals post. And so this is a list of methods, HTTP methods we want allowed. So when you're like posting from a form or creating something um, and pushing data, 
uh, to the server, then you use a post or a put request. So I'm using a post request, that's what TradingView sends. They're gonna be posting data to us rather than just doing a get request, right? So now if I go to webhook slash webhook, you'll see it returns invalid method. Because when I just enter that in my browser, that's a get request. So what I wanna do is test a post request that posts this payload. So I got that payload and I'm using this Insomnia client, which lets me post test post requests, right? So if you don't have this, I covered it in another video. Type Insomnia client and get this. It's a very useful tool. If you're building any kind of APIs uh, in Python on the web, you need a tool like either Postman or Insomnia to test those requests. You can use curl or wget and other uh, command line utilities as well if you're familiar, but this is a nice uh, graphical one. You want Insomnia Core, you click uh, latest release and you can download Insomnia Core for Mac or OS X or Windows. It's cross-platform, it's free. So this is it and you do, and with this you can create a new request, right? And I'm gonna call it TradingView uh, post request and I'm going to select whether it's a get, post, put, patch, or delete. We're doing a post request and the body, we're gonna do type other here because I think uh, TradingView just posted, it's like plain and we're telling it it's JSON here. So uh, it's not sending any headers for JSON, we're just posting raw JSON here. So I'm gonna do create, okay? And so what I've done is take that payload we discussed earlier, right? And I've put in a passphrase, A, B, C, D, F, G, H, and then this is an example of a TradingView webhook triggering. It would post this data to our local server. And so if I do localhost 5000, just like I did here, or 127, localhost and 127.001 is the same. So I'm gonna post to my webhook uh, this message. And I click that, it says this is webhook route, right? So it's not doing anything useful yet, but we do know that we can send a post request to this webhook route. So now what we wanna do is take this data and send an order to Alpaca. So uh, to do that, I'm going to open this code here and let's change the response and let's just say uh, code success. So we're, we'll return a dictionary that'll become JSON. We can return success if it succeeds or failure if it fails. So I'm just gonna return success for now. Okay, so code success has returned. And so now let's create an order. So we get this, this data in our post request. And so to access this data, we need to import another, another thing. We need to import request. So Flask re provides this request object where you can get information about the request that was sent. And so we're gonna get the data from the post request. And then we're also gonna load it into a dictionary by using this JSON module. So we're gonna import JSON as well. And that's not part of Flask. Uh, we're just gonna import it like that. So import config and JSON. And I'm also gonna import requests with an S because that's another library that lets us send HTTP requests outward. And that's what I'm gonna use to send the Discord uh, channel uh, message. Okay, so I'm gonna import requests there. Okay, and so now I already have an API and so now um, I'm going to first get a copy of the message. So I'm gonna say webhook message, I'm calling it webhook message. I'm gonna do json.loads request.data. So the data that's posted in, I'm gonna use json.loads to convert that to a dictionary. And then I should have that webhook message, okay? And let's return that message just so you see what that looks like. Return webhook message. So if I send it, you'll see we now have the message available to us. So we can access these keys inside of here. So if I want the price, I can do um, I can do uh, order price here. So webhook message. And since this is in inside of the strategy key, I want strategy like that. And then I want strategy. And then inside of that, I want the order price. Okay. So I'll do that. And I'll also say, uh, so price equals that. I'm going to say quantity equals webhook message strategy. And I'm gonna take this order contracts here, which is 171. And so whatever's posted, we'll have an automatically update. We'll take the uh, prices that are reported by TradingView, the, pr the price, the number of contracts, we're storing those in variables and we're gonna send those variables to uh, the Alpaca API. So we have a symbol and that's stored in ticker. So I'm gonna do webhook message ticker, okay. And then, so we have a, and then we have a side, right? So this is uh, order action. So side equals webhook message uh, strategy order action. 
Okay, so we should have, I think that's all we really need. Let's, let's just place a market order just to make sure uh, this goes in. Since the market's not open, I'm not gonna be able to fill a limit order, but I'm gonna show you how we queue uh, an order up. Okay, so in alpaca right, we can say uh, order equals API dot. And if you look at our functions here that are available, our methods, you see the submit order. Okay, and then it shows me my parameters. So I need symbol, quantity, side type. So I have, I have that stuff already, symbol, quantity, side type. Okay, and so type, uh, actually we can do a limit order marker. It doesn't matter, this isn't gonna get filled. The market uh, isn't open. Uh, and then we can tell it a limit price and we can say our limit price. Uh, let's use uh, the price that was here. So order price, right? So I'll use limit price of price here. So limit price equals price. Okay. And then I believe I need that good till canceled as well. So let's see if that works. Let's, let's see if this will place an order. Okay. Uh, I think maybe the GTC goes here. Let's check on the order. So submit order side type of order, then time and force, right? And then limit price. Okay, so that, that looks good. Um, so I'm going to print the response. So I'm gonna print order to the console and let's see what happens. So I'm gonna submit this payload that TradingView would send us and I get an error, you know, it didn't work perfectly the first time. It says positional argument follows keyword argument. So it looks like I left a comma there, run it again and I didn't get an error and let's look at our console. Let's see if we got anything. Uh, looks like it did indeed submit an order. We have some IDs. So that looks like a successful order was submitted. And since we have a dashboard, right, we can check if it was. So I just submitted this. I'm gonna refresh it and look at that. 32 minutes past the hour, there was a quantity of 171 submitted for a limit price of 127.50. And then if I look inside of my real Alpaca account, uh, you can also verify that limit buy just went in. So if I submitted another one, right, uh, let's say uh, 128.50, click send, you should see this refresh. So you see uh, Alpaca seems to refresh in real time like that, which is cool. So it accepted that order there as well. So that's really all we need actually, right? So trading view, we use our Pine script, we create our alert, we create it as a webhook, and then that webhook posts this message. We have a Python application that receives this message and can place orders in Alpaca. So we have a complete flow and that's running locally. We've tested it uh, with real payloads using uh, the Insomnia client here. And so what's the only thing left to do is to hook this up to TradingView. So we have TradingView open. And instead of, when we go to these this gear, instead of showing pop-up sending email, we just need to enter, the, enter in the webhook URL so that TradingView knows where this web, app, web application is. So where is it? It's on my local laptop right now, right? So I wanna deploy this to the cloud and this is where Heroku comes into play. Another step here. And I'll also show you how to have it just running locally. So bear with me, let's let's do one last step and get this dashboard running in the cloud. So, so to get started with Heroku, sign up for free. I'm at heroku.com. You just click sign up for free. You see it supports a variety of programming languages there and frameworks. So if you wanted to make a Ruby on Rails app, Node.js app, Java apps, Go, all that stuff, it's all supported, PHP. I'm using Python here. It's really easy to deploy Flask applications here. Click sign up for free, uh, sign up, uh, and it is actually free. So uh, if the only way it's not free is if you've run a whole big company on top of this and need scalability and all this stuff, then, then they'll eventually start charging you. Okay, so I already signed up and I already logged in. And so I have a list of applications that I've created. And so I can create a new app just for this webhook. And I'm gonna call it uh, Alpaca Webhook or Trading View Alpaca Webhook. And I'm gonna click Create App. And I'm gonna host it in the United States, create it. Um, I've taken that name. Now, if you try to use that name, you probably can't. So choose a unique name and this will show you how to get started. So to get started, they give you a CLI tool to make it easy to deploy. So it says download and install Heroku CLI. Make sure you do that on um, OS X. You'll probably have homebrew. And so you'll do a brew install like this. And so just to show you that real quick, I, I type uh, brew install, right? And then if you don't have homebrew, just, just, go just Google that, install homebrew Mac. If you're creating a lot of developer tools and doing a lot of development on Mac, 
you should have homebrew installed and it gives you a simple command to install homebrew and then homebrew you use that to install uh, Heroku. If you're on Windows, they probably have a setup exe, you can download the installer, or if you're on Ubuntu, there's another way to install it here. There's a bunch of Linux distributions. So I'm using Homebrew to install it on my Mac, and then you'll see it'll run, update Homebrew, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so once that finishes, so I already actually have it. So if I type Heroku, you see I have this command line command which with all of these different uh, options, right? So if all I need to do is type Heroku login, so I'm going to type uh, Heroku login. So I'm gonna to go to my command line here. Heroku login, type that. It says, press any key to open the browser to log in. So this will pop up something and I just say, uh, give it permission for the CLI to access my Heroku account. So I did that and then now I should be able to use my Heroku commands. And so to create a new Heroku app, and synchronize my local code with what gets deployed to Heroku, I go into my project directory, which I'm already in here, trading view off Hacker webhook. I initialize it as a Git repository. So I do Git in it, make sure you have Git installed. You should have it already since that's where I post all of these code examples. So Git in it, I have initialized a Git repository and then I copy this command and that creates a new remote repository. So I have my local Git repository and then by typing this, I add this remote uh, code repository uh, that's on Heroku, and that's the remote. And so I make my changes locally, commit them locally, and then I push them remotely, and then Heroku packages all of this up and deploys it uh, as an app. Okay, so I got that going, and so now I need to deploy it. So I'm gonna add my code to my repository. So I type git add dot. Okay, so I have all these files, git add dot, and I'm going to commit and give it a message. So I'm gonna call it, I'm gonna say my message is initial commit. Do that, it adds my files, and then I just knew, do git push Heroku master. So let's see if this deploys our application to the cloud. And I already know something that will go wrong here, and then we're gonna fix it. So I'm gonna make a mistake on purpose, and then we're gonna show you how to look at the Heroku logs and debug that, and then we're going to push a fix for our code into production, okay? So since I have a requirements text here, uh, Heroku knows which uh, dependencies to install. So it's taking my requirements text here, and you see it says remote, it's installing all of those packages on the Heroku side of things on the server, packaging them up, uh, getting my source code, it has a repository, all that code's getting committed, and then it's gonna be able to run my app in the cloud. So after this is done, it's gonna give me a nice URL at herokuapp.com, and that should be mapped to my application, okay? So it says done, and it says tradingview alpaca webhook.herokuapp.com was deployed to Heroku. And now if I go to this in the browser, you, you should see an error, right? So I'm gonna do that. And it says application error. An error occurred in the application, your page cannot be served. So to debug it, it says run Heroku logs tail. And what this does is let you see the lo server logs from your local machine without SSHing in or doing anything, right? So this Heroku command gives you the ability to see the logs. And so I type Heroku log tail, you can see the logs of, oh, initial release, sees it, I see that it built and released, and then here's my error, no web process is running. And what that means, if you look that up, is it, it actually doesn't know how to serve up my application yet. It has the code, but I didn't give it like the software needed to, or the process needed to run this app. So this is gonna use a web server uh, to run our app or an application server. And so there's one last thing you need, and it's a proc file. And so if you look up Heroku proc file, so if you look at any guide here, you'll see uh, the definition of the proc file. So if I look at proc file, you just need this little line here, adding a proc file. And so I create a new file and I'm doing capital P proc file like that. And inside that file, I'm putting this web unicorn app app. So it says, uh, we're serving up a web app, we're using unicorn and we need, since our app is called app.py, you put this name app here and it knows where it is and how to serve it up. And so now if I deploy that again, I'm gonna do git at dot, I'm gonna commit it, added proc file, and I'm gonna push Heroku master. And I'm gonna push this up to the cloud again and it should redeploy it with this proc file and I'll know to use unicorn to serve up this web application. So I let it finish 
I still have the same address and let's reload it and see if it works now. So just like that, you see we have this live public dashboard of all of my trades and this is linked to my account. So there's one more step we're gonna wanna add, right? Our webhook can be posted to from anyone and that's why we put that little webhook message, uh, that webhook passphrase in this config.py so we need it to say some long string one, two, three. So what I wanna do is process uh, this webhook message and make sure it has the valid pass passphrase that uh, matches what's in our config.py. So I'm gonna say if a webhook message, in our webhook message we're sending in this passphrase. So webhook message passphrase does not equal config.webhook passphrase then we're gonna abort with a 403 unauthorized. It's gonna stop uh, the request. Or we can just return a response like um, a dictionary and say code error and say pass or message, nice try buddy. And it'll just stop the request right there and then none of this logic will run and they can't really do anything, right? So if I post this now to my local webhook, uh, let me run the application again. So I'm gonna do flash run start it back up i'm going to test this and i get the error nice try buddy because i sent a b c d e f g h and it doesn't match this webhook passphrase that's in here so if i post the correct passphrase and put that in my trading view payload and do that it actually executes the trade and goes through and then now if i refresh you'll see that we have another trade there so that worked as planned so i have this minimal layer of protection here and now that that's protected, I can also add my new version of app.py and commit it again. So you can see how you can maintain this application locally, added passphrase, and then push Heroku master. And you can just iterate locally and then keep pushing it to Heroku. And I don't need to like log into the server, install, install a web server, configure uh, Nginx config, Apache config, um, SSL, all these other things you would, you would have to do normally and update a server. Um, I'm just pushing code to the server and letting Heroku worry about that. So that's what a platform is a service. That's the power, power it provides. And so this will get deployed in a moment and we'll have this updated uh, code here. And so um, what I'll do now is get ready to test this. So I'm gonna go back to ABCD123, ABC123, and then we're gonna get while that's deploying, I'm gonna get the address and make sure it works remotely. So I'm gonna run this trade again and I'm gonna to post to that address slash webhook. And so I'm gonna post it remotely. And if I can post it remotely, then I know TradingView can post to it as well. Okay, so it's deployed. I'm going to run it, click post. It says, nice try buddy. buddy. So I have my password protection in and I'm gonna do my sum long string or whatever password you use. So sum long string one, two, three and boom, and then go back to my public dashboard and you see I placed another trade. So that's it for our webhook and our dashboard. And just for fun, one last bonus feature, uh, I'm going to fire up Discord here. If you're unfamiliar with Discord, it's similar to Slack. It's used by gamers typically, uh, but it's a free chat room basically. And they provide ways to integrate with that chat room and create bots and so forth. And so I'm gonna have my little chat room, part-time Larry server, I created an, a new uh, chat server here, and I'm gonna have our webhook automatically post our trades to this uh, chat bot. So uh, to do that, uh, I'm gonna go to my channel here, and on my server, I click on my server name, and I'm gonna say server settings, and completely optional, you can do this if you want to. I'm gonna do integrations, and I'm going to create a webhook, right? And so I created a webhook, so I do new webhook, and I'll call it alpaca alerts, and I'll link it to a certain channel, and then hit save. So I'm gonna copy the URL it generated and hit save. Okay. So you see I have this webhook that's good to go. And so this webhook looks like this. So I'm gonna do a new request, my web uh, Discord webhook, and let's try posting to this thing and see what happens, right? So this is gonna accept a JSON payload. So I'm gonna put JSON there. And then I copied my webhook URL it gave me. So it generates this long URL that I can use and it, I can post messages to that, right? And so it expects some JSON to get posted. And so if I go to Discord, uh, webhook payload, 
uh, we can see the format that it expects. So we just need to post some data uh, to a Discord. And so uh, there's some long documentation, but I, I've extracted this out already. And so I'll show you what it accepts. So the chat message, looks, a basic chat message uh, looks like this. So uh, it's just JSON data. You need to give it a username for your bot. So I'm gonna call it strategy alert. And then you need to, you can give it an avatar if you want to. So um, I have one here that I can use just for fun. So you can give it a logo or whatever, however you want your bot to be represented. So I'm gonna do uh, avatar URL. Okay, so I have a little avatar and then I need to give it some content. And the content is just the string that you want, what you want the chat message to be. And so I'm gonna do an F string, or I'm gonna do a string here, and I'm going to say uh, Bollinger Band strategy. And I'm just gonna post this to my Discord app and let's see what happens. So if I, I do that, I go to my chat room and it says strategy alert, Bollinger Band strategy. So I tested this webhook URL from my Insomnia client, right? And so now I'm just gonna post to this URL um, from my Python application. So I'll go here and I'll say uh, Discord URL. Let's just give it a URL up here. So I'll do Discord URL. And I'm gonna use the URL they generated for me that I copied to my clipboard. And then I'm just gonna use the Python request library to post a, a message to uh, the uh, chat server. So when this webhook comes in, I'm gonna say chat message. Let's just create a little dictionary and I'm gonna do the same thing, right? I'm gonna take this and post it in here. And so I'm gonna set chat message equal to this, chat message equals this, right? Strategy alert, some avatar. And then since I'm in my Python side, I can use the variables that come in from my webhook and say volunteer band strategy triggered. And I put an F string here. So there's an F in front of there and I can put some var named variables in there as a result. So I'll say a quantity symbol at price and put that in there. And then now I just want to post that uh, webhook message. So I'm gonna do request.post and I'm gonna do a discord URL that I set above. And I'm gonna say JSON equals chat message. And it should post that, that message as JSON to my discord webhook URL. My app is not running. So I'm gonna run it back up, flask run, post it. And let's see if we get a response. Let's look in our discord server. And sure enough, Bollinger Band strategy triggered 171 Apple shares at 128.50, which matches my payload that would be sent by TradingView. So that's that's great. So now we have a cool way to have a little chatbot integrated with TradingView, which is a feature that's the powerful of the power of these webhooks is it lets us add functionality in our own code and hook it into TradingView and add our own custom functionality. And so I can just deploy that to app.py, commit that, add a Discord support. And then I added a new feature. So I'll do git push Heroku master and have that deployed to the cloud. And then this functionality is available remotely. And then the final thing to do to hook it up to TradingView is we get our URL uh, that's been given to us. And let's go back to here. Uh, this is our remote uh, address. And so we have that. And so we just go back to TradingView and we go to our webhook. We say we want a webhook URL and we have a webhook URL now. Boom, slash webhook. It's gonna post the message and it's gonna post the message just like the one that we tested and it's gonna create a chat message. It's gonna place an alpaca order and we can just walk away and let this trade our account and post messages to our subscriber list or whatever whatever you do with your chat room, you know? So I'm gonna save that and that's good to go. And when the market's open, this will actually work and place trades for us and automatically trade based on whatever strategy we have loaded into PineScript, in this case, a Bollinger Band uh, breakout strategy. So uh, that's it, that's it for this video. We covered so much stuff here. Oh, and last but not least, Let's pretend you don't wanna use Heroku at all, and for some reason you wanna use your laptop and just have that open and function as your server. Um, I promise that I'll show you how to do that as well. So ngrok, you have a way to uh, tunnel, create a tunnel address to your local machine. So I'm gonna click get started for free, and uh, you sign up for an account or whatever. So I've already done that, and it gives you this free utility that you can use, and it shows you how to install it. So you install it, you download it, you just unzip it, and it's just a script an executable that you run on your local machine. So you download that and you'll get this ngrok here. So I'm downloading that now. 
and I just put that in some path on my machine and then you can link this uh, to your local server. So uh, let's do that. So I'm unzipping it, or I'm, so I'm downloading this now and I'll let that finish. And I think it's already finished actually. So I already downloaded that locally and I just put the zip file inside of my project directory here and let me just unzip it. So unzip it with whatever utility you have. And then, so I get this little ngrok utility here and let's see how to use that. So I'm gonna go to my local directory here and type uh, ngrok dot slash ngrok and it'll run this command, right? And so this gives me details about the command. So it says run this to connect it to your account. So I'll do that. So it saves some kind of token. And then I just type ngrok HTTP and then some uh, port number that I wanna serve up, that I wanna forward to port 80. So since my Flask application, I'm gonna run it and it's running on port 5000, I can create my terminal and let's run ngrok here, right? So I can do ngrok and then I just say uh, serve up port 5000. So this says port 80, but I'm running on port 5000. And so this will give me a secure URL. So ngrok HTTP 5000 and it'll create some kind of tunnel here and then gives me this URL that's remotely accessible. So this is a, a secure URL right here and it can map to my local machine. And so if I go here to this address, this address is already in the cloud. And if you look, you'll see it's actually hitting my local machine. So I'm gonna go here to my Flask application. If I refresh that, you'll see it's actually, that URL is hitting my local machine, right? So if I make a change here, let's go in my template real quick and just go, uh, this is local. Even though that's a remote URL, you see that word, this is local, is printed right here below Alpaca dashboard. And so that proves my local changes. If I just wanna run this locally without deploying it to the cloud, this gives me a remotely accessible URL. And so I can take this URL slash webhook now and connect this to my uh, webhook URL, paste that right in here. And now I have a way to remotely uh, expose my local server if I want to. I don't typically do that, but a lot of people don't wanna deal with Heroku and Amazon and all that. But I like to have something running in the cloud, same way I serve my websites and things like that. So um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Look at all we covered. We covered a basic Pine script. We talked about uh, Bollinger Band breakout strategies. We talked about alerting JSON payloads, webhook, URLs, we created a Flask application from scratch. We talked about deploying to the cloud using Heroku, and we talked about tunneling to our local machine using ngrok. So covered tons of material. I hope you learned something. You can do all kinds of cool stuff with this. We even did Discord. We integrated it with a chatbot. So tons of stuff we, we covered in this hour. And so, yeah, I hope you liked it. Uh, please like and subscribe for future videos and keep posting on the message board. Follow me on Twitter, all that stuff. I know I don't always get back to everything because it takes a long time to create these videos, but I promise you I'm gonna keep going on with this for years and years. So uh, this community is only going to continue to grow. So uh, thanks a lot for watching and stay tuned for the next video.